All right, good evening, everybody. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, February the 13th, 2023 at 7 p.m. at Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. If the board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card, indicate the topic to be addressed, and those can be placed in the basket on that table over there to my right. I have allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment. All right, please everybody rise for the a Pledge of Allegiance uh, with Henry Puffer School. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Lee Hart. It took me two seconds to screw something up, so. <laughs> Uh, we're really excited tonight to share Henry Puffer's story, uh, not only from our students, parents, and the school's lenses. We got a great turnout today. Uh, we have our uh, student council uh, sponsors, Julie Beckwitz and Bray Judicki. We have some of our student council reps, our president, Gianna Keefe, um, Sandra Singdalson, and Parker Salzman. And we have two of our PTA members, our PTA presidents, uh, Michelle Morgan and Nikki Brown. So. Just like it should be, we're going to start with the students. Hi, I'm Parker Salzman, the Vice President at Henry Puffer School, and we do a lot of fundraisers that help our community. We're going to raffle off a giant teddy bear. You can buy a raffle ticket for $1 that has the chance to be pulled out of a jar winning you the bear. All the proceeds will go to a local humane society in Downers Grove. We will also do a raffle for a pie in the face. You can also buy tickets for $1. You can put your ticket in a staff member's jar if they participate. And if yours gets pulled from their jar, you get to throw a pie in their face. Similarly, all the proceeds will go to a local homeless shelter in Downers Grove. Hi, my name is Gianna Keefe and I'm the student council president. We have done a lot of things for our school in the past. As student council, we are making different fun activities that encourage good behavior and attitudes. Something we do to help our school be better is participating in different activities. Some examples would be Red Ribbon Week and teaching about safe to help. Teaching and participating in these activities helps students feel more safe and it helps our school remain in an effective learning environment. We are hoping to make this an awesome year with a lot of fun activities that make our school even better. Hi, my name is Sandra Singh Dolson and I'm the Student Council Treasurer. This year, Student House Council has sponsored many Spirit Days. A few examples are PJ Day, Bring Your Stuffed Animal to School Day, and Dress Up Like a Holiday Character. Some Spirit Days serve as fundraisers. We ask students to donate a dollar to participate in these special Spirit Days, such as Wear a Hat to School Day. These Spirit Days are a win-win. Students have fun, and we raise money for the Student Council. I want to make this year a lot better than last year. One of our main goals is trying to maintain positive attitudes and good behavior. How we are planning and doing this is by including prizes. We got funds from PTA to have prizes to put on a prize reel to spin if a student got five blue tickets. The blue tickets only got passed out to a student if a teacher or staff member saw or sees continuous good behavior. These blue tickets along with the prize reel should start to implement better attitudes. We will also be trying to have mental sales and more creative spirit days. We want to keep on giving money and things to people that need in our communities. And we have many plans that support that. For our student council committee this year, we have been and are trying to keep up positivity and optimism. Our goals include us keeping up good ideas to keep students engaged and wanting to come to Henry Puffer School and learn. Thank you for allowing us to come and tell you a little bit about what we do here at Henry Puffer School. Up next, we have our PTA presidents, Michelle Morgan and Nikki Brown. Hi. Thanks for having us. Um, 
Like you said, I'm Michelle Morgan. This is Nikki Brown. Um, we're the current co-presidents at uh, Henry Puffer PTA. Um, we started out this school year with our annual Gene Pogue Lung Run. Um, Gene Pogue spent 30 years as a PE teacher at Henry Puffer and was ahead of our time promoting healthy lifestyle in kids by staying active and making good food choices. She started this healthy run many years back and this year's was extra special because now it serves as a memorial run. Jean Pogue passed this spring at a healthy age of 95. Um, over the holidays, our PTA, along with the community, came together and put on a holiday breakfast at Henry Puffer. This is a long tradition at Henry Puffer where scouts, parents, and other groups donate handmade uh, items and sell them at the breakfast to raise money for our families that are less fortunate. This year, the PTA was able to purchase uh, $2,500 in gift cards to distribute to these families during the holiday season. Um, and now we're gearing up for our big annual spring fundraiser. Um, in more recent years, we have raised over $30,000 each, each spring during this event. Um, because of the success of this event, um, we're able to provide students and staff with so many wonderful enrichments, including STEAM materials, new books in the library, uh, classroom learning enhancement, en enhancements, building enhancements, um, Henry Puffer <coughs> spirit t-shirts for each student, and so much more. Uh, we look forward to continuing to support the students and staff of Henry Puffer and have a great rest of the school year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it's my pleasure to talk about a few points of pride here at Henry Puffer and I think uh, the first thing that I say, this is what we talked about the first day that we all met uh, way back in August, is it starts and ends with people. I think what makes Henry Puffer such a great school is the people, the students, the teachers, the families in the community. Everything that we do is based around those relationships and those are kind of our driving force of what we try to do. So kind of along that point, uh, one of the things that we're really proud of at Henry Puffer are our families. Our families are an opportunity for every one of our staff members to pull groups of kids once a month and talk about our Puffer Promise. And those groups of kids range from students in, ki in kindergarten all the way up to the sixth grade. And uh, when we meet, we talk about the things that we value and what makes us uh, Puffer proud. And um, you know, it's it's just a really great opportunity for kids to kind of interact with peers across the across the school, as well as uh, staff members that maybe they might not come into contact with on a regular basis. Um, another thing we're really really excited about are renovations. So if you see that picture up there in the top right hand corner of the screen, those are our new floors this year in our third to fourth grade hallways. Um, I, I, I can tell you the first uh, time I stepped foot in Henry Puffer when Principal Wazik was giving me a tour, um, it's like night and day from there. So uh, <laughs> it's beautiful. We're really, really excited about it. Uh, tuck pointing took place over the summer. Um, there's going to be a little bit more this, this summer as well as a little more asbestos uh, abatement. And then uh, another thing we're really excited about is brand new gym floors. Uh, in in uh, in our gymnasium, I wish that uh, it would have made me a little bit better when we were playing the <laughs> Harlem Wizards, but we still had fun. Um, the next one is Watchdogs. This is a program that's dear to my heart. Um, it's a program that uh, I've always had anywhere that I've been, and it's a program that was at Henry Puffer in previous years that uh, we brought back uh, now that you know we're moving forward from the pandemic. It's an opportunity to get fathers and father figures in our school. Um, a lot of times it's more natural for our mothers uh, to you know, have a presence in the school and this is really an opportunity to get dads in there. We've already had nearly 100 of our dads out of 240 something dads sign up this year. Uh, they spend a half day where they get a chance to spend some time in the classroom as well as lunch and recess with the kids and just kind of get that experience in. Uh, all of our dads have kind of walked out of it saying, you know, they really do appreciate, have a deeper appreciation for what's going on in the school. Um, and uh, some of the other benefits are, you know, students having that impact from a male role model in the building as well as the security feature. Uh, one of the things our dads do is they walk the hallways, they secure doors to make sure, you know, um, uh, everything's going, and then high fives. Uh, I do let all of our dads know when they show up, make sure that they're stretching. We had a little bit of a calf injury earlier in the year, <laughs> but, um, you know, all good. Um, I do want to, I do want to give a special shout out to uh, John Lazeri and uh, Joe DiGiacomo. They are our top dogs, so they're the dads that kind of rally the, the, the other dads in our community for that program. 
Um, beyond that, we have a lot of amazing clubs and activities. The running club, the podcast club. Uh, we, we just added a math club, um, as well as our Earth Student Council, obviously, and our photography club. So uh, we're really excited about a lot of the amazing things going on. And once again, it all starts and ends with the people. So, um, if you know anything about me, my background's in economics. I love talking about data. And so uh, I was really excited to present you know, some of the things that uh, are going on at Henry Puffer. So, um, the goal of this is just kind of talk about where we were in the spring at the end of last year uh, and where we are today, what we focused on, and uh, kind of how we got to this point, as well as kind of what our next steps are. So um, at the end of the year last year in spring, you can see that our overall growth was in that expected range. Uh, our students were doing an excellent job as far as hitting those uh, pr uh, propensity uh, growth scores. Um, the SLT had the chance to kind of do a little deep dive into the data and you can see um, reading and math are both kind of um, in that expected range with reading just slightly below math. So that kind of drove some of the uh, further conversations as we use the cycle of inquiry process to kind of identify what we wanted to do this year. So a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper into the reading, you can see uh, expected growth is uh, in that expected range, um, all of our all of our uh, grade levels are kind of in the ex expected range or slightly below in that um, near uh, um, nearly meeting. <clears throat> and then this is where we are come winter. So you can see that we uh, are we're still in the expected growth, but it grew a little bit as far as the reading scores go. Um, some of the some of the really exciting things is the percentage of our students that met benchmark increased from 47 percent of our students that met their benchmark scores to 53 in the winter. Uh, the growth effect size increased, uh, changed for each cohort. So if we were looking at kindergarten, or kinder, kindergarten to first grade or second to third grade, those cohorts of students um, increased uh, as far as their growth uh, effect size. And then uh, uh, the percentage of our students that ended up in that higher or expected growth went from 73% in, in those two ranges up to 79% in the winter. So uh, a couple of things we talk about are lag measures and lead measures. These are lag measures. These are the measures that you really don't have control over. So when you sit down and you take the test, the results are going to be what the results are going to be, and you have no control over it. What you can control is the process along the way, and those are the things that you, we do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So as we were, as we were diving in and finding those root causes of where we can get the, the biggest bang for our buck or the highest growth, we wanted to find things that we could uh, latch onto what we're already doing and be a little bit more purposeful and intentional with. So uh, our school came up with two goals. Uh, they're both aligned with our district, uh, our district goals. Uh, the first one is that reading goal, and you can see that it's a love of literacy. And the second one would be to kind of go along with that positive psychology piece with our orange frog training uh, that is uh, building uh, positive cultures. Um, and that orange frog training kind of ties in with the teachings of Sean Aker and the happiness advantage. Uh, I did uh, put a few bullets up there about some of our guiding beliefs. Um, first and foremost, we believe that all students can learn. Uh, we, we believe relationships are the foundation for everything. Um, consistent activity over time yields results, aka where you water, your grass will grow. What we focus on on a consistent basis is where we're going to see those results. Um, what we're looking for, we're going to find and uh, do less better. So one of the things that we really, really try to do is be intentional with our goals and make sure that they're aligned with the district goals so that they're, they're going to kind of be along the same paths. So for that first goal, as far as the love of literacy goes, um, <clears throat> we, we, uh, as we got to the root cause and there were some surveys with students, we were finding that students weren't reading for fun. and they. They weren't having a general just love of picking up a book and reading it. So we started asking ourselves the question, why? And um, one, of the, one of the things that we came up with is we need to be more intentional about modeling what really good readers are doing. And specifically, we targeted that read aloud area of the day each day. 
Um, so we wanted to we wanted to make sure that that time during the day where we're doing read alouds, we're being really intentional as far as that teacher and student response <clears throat> that we're aligning with our priority standards. Um, we ask teachers after every single benchmark assessment to go through the assessment data and uh, identify you know what's working well and where are there opportunities from for growth and from there we identified some um, opportunity rip bands and standards through our learning continuum which is within our NWA map <clears throat> we use those that that learning continuum as far as the topics and the standards go to align it with with our uh, <clears throat> with our writing resource um, and then uh, every month, uh, uh, our PD is kind of built towards supporting some of that writing priority standards and, uh, and in turn, our read aloud lessons. Our second goal uh, was to establish uh, and encourage a culture of climate that's rooted in positive psychology. So this kind of goes along with the happiness advantage. I had the opportunity to do the orange frog training. Uh, that was one of my first experiences here in Downers Grove. And um, it's, it's a great book and it's a great mindset. So you can see that's the, that's the crew that we sent from uh, Puffer and Grove this year to do the Orange Frog <laughs> training. Um, and this is kind of goes along with that what you look for you find. So we're looking for the positives and we want to shine a light on what's going right in our school as well as you know, what those expectations are. So um, Everything that we do is aligned with our puffer promise. Our puffer promise is over there on the bottom right hand of the screen. That, those are the talking points at all of our family meetings each month, where every month we have a different pillar that we focus on that we believe uh, can show um, respectful, responsible, and peaceful behavior. Um, so um, that, that to go along with that, uh, kind of what our student council talked about. We have blue tickets that we can pass out for individual students as well as uh, whole class ones where we're just shining a light on the wonderful things happening. Um, one of the things Sean Aker talks about is the, the 15 minutes of walking time is really good for that positive psychology. So on non-faculty meeting Wednesdays, we meet in the gym, a group of teachers, and you just go out for a walk and get to know people um, as you know, individuals. Um, one of the things that we were trying to do is, I think uh, COVID siloed us in a lot of ways where you know, we ended up in our own classrooms and it was tough to get out of those four walls and we wanted to use this as an opportunity to reconnect with our, our peers in the building and get to know people on a more personal level. Um, all of our staff meetings start out with an orange icebreaker of some sort uh, where we can model one of the seven principles. Uh, we send out positive postcards at all of our staff meetings. One of the postcards is sent home in the mail to the kids to let them know what a great job that they're doing. And the other one is sent to a staff member for the same purposes. Uh, we start every meeting with a spark of the meeting where teachers or staff members are able to shine a light on a peer that's going above and beyond in the building. And then uh, one of the opportunities that came out of the Orange Frog training this year was our preschool schedule isn't aligned with our elementary schedule, so it makes it difficult as far as like faculty meetings and things like that go to connect with our preschool peers. So, um, uh, um, so our preschool sends a representative to all of our faculty meetings so that they can be a part of those meetings and just kind of, you know, feel a little bit more part of that puffer community. We have orange Mondays, so we wear our orange on Mondays. We get really excited about that. And then every now and then we, we drop some joyous surprises on each other. So uh, we say you don't have to wear orange to be orange, but it's more of a mindset and it's more about, you know, uh, looking for the, the positives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and for our student council members, we have a couple of gifts for you. So member Weiner is going to come down. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Great seeing you. All right, listed on tonight's agenda are two communications received by the board. Are there additional communications a board member would like to share at this time? I would just like to note we did get that one this morning in support of full day kindergarten. I responded to her, but just so you know, since we're going to be discussing that tonight, I just 
wanted to make sure that was uh, on the record, but it will show up in the communication report in March's meeting. Uh, all right, that brings us to the spotlight on our school. Welcome, Mr. Sissel. How are you? Thanks. I'm well. How are you? Uh, tonight is our winter data snapshot. So this is the uh, walkthrough, uh, a high-level overview of winter benchmarking data, um, the AIMS Web Plus data and the map data in the format that we've been using now. This will be the third time through. One addition is that our, our AIMS Web data is also available in the ECRA platform. So tonight, we'll look side by side, and then going forward, we may shift that format just a little bit. We want to talk through both the data itself, how we look at that, and then a couple of examples of how we respond both to a higher than expected example and a slightly lower than expected example as we go through. So first things first, when we get the data back from ECRA, we get some initial impressions from them as our consultants. And so this is just sort of a, a general summary. Really, we are in the expected range pretty much across the board, a couple of higher than expected and a couple of lower than expected. But the preview here is you're going to see a lot of green circles as we go through this report, which is a really exciting thing. That tells us that we are very much on track and, and, and seeing the results we would hope for. A couple of things to note, the, the K2 growth norms are um affecting some of the reporting. So as it says up there, kindergarten and first grade are post-pandemic norms, but second through eighth grade are pre-pandemic norms. And so really what that means is that while NWEA has not updated its full norming study, ECRA has used some of this information to create those two different sets. So two through eight, we're looking at um, pre-pandemic norms, which means we can compare ourselves to where we were pre-COVID. K-1 is since that time. And then the other just thing to note is that our fifth grade students, any of our fifth grade students who are accelerating into sixth or seventh grade math this year have been administered the MAP 6 plus MAP uh, math assessment, excuse me. So the, the math assessment breaks down into a grades two through five assessment and a grade six and above assessment. We took, made a recommendation and took some guidance that said we should be testing the students in the grade level in which they are being instructed, which is consistent with some of the NWA guidance. What we learned uh, this winter is that that means that ECRA isn't presenting a growth score for those students. So we're investigating that with ECRA to see if there's a way to rectify that for this year. If there's not, it will likely shift our decision making around that assessment delivery for next year so that we can be sure all students are captured within this platform. Just a few reminder slides that we put up um, each time right now. A reminder of how ECRA generates some of these targets. So we look at everything we knew about a student from prior year's performance that and, and our local norms. That yields what's called a propensity score from which projections are made for every assessment. And then we take the student's actual score and compare it, compare it excuse me, to that projection, which gives us their growth <coughs> interval. So we're no longer talking about growth from fall to winter. We're talking about growth based on winter performance against the projection that was set for each individual student based on last year's information. This is just a reminder about the growth scores and effect size. So when we look at these ranges, a negative growth, a negative number doesn't mean that there was no growth. It means that it was less than the overall expected growth and that, that changes as we go on to different ranges. A reminder of the colors. When we see those green circles again, that's the expected growth range. A blue circle says we are a standard deviation higher for that group than expected growth. A yellow says we are a standard deviation lower. And then a red is two standard deviations lower than expected growth. So first, going back to something we've been presenting for well over a decade, just taking a look at, at this moment in time, what does our map data look like? So these are our reading scores by grade level. The left chart is this year. The right-hand chart is a year ago at the same benchmarking period. And, and really, this is a demonstration of consistently high achievement across both years. Those median percentiles are all above 70, which we, you know, which we know statistically says that's a high mark of high performance. We know that by looking on the, the far right column, which is the achievement percentile. Bless you. The achievement percentile is compared to all of the other first grade data in the MAP norming study, that 79 median percentile puts us at the 96th percentile of all data in there. So these truly are, through NWA, in terms of achievement at a moment in time, these, these are numbers to celebrate across the board. And similarly with the math data. And again, we've kind of put this year and last year side by side to, to note that we're continuing to see slightly higher achievement in almost every grade level and very comparable uh, across the board. And this kind of bears out in, in our growth measures as well. 
<coughs> Shifting over to AIMS, we start with kindergarten early numeracy. And again, we look to that far right early numeracy composite where we see a larger um, green in the, in the chart there in the graph and then the yellow and red moving further into at risk. So again, this shows us that the vast majority of our students are not at risk for achieving success in early numeracy in kindergarten. And then this is the first time we can then look at how does this translate into ECRA. And so this is the same measure, winter, early numeracy, and kindergarten. First we look at the bottom right where we look for that color, and so it's a 0.23 on the positive side, which is on the high end of expected growth, which is the green dot. And then just as a point of reference as we're looking at these, these charts, I won't zero in on every single one. There are a couple later in the presentation that I will. Each tiny little circle or dot, depending on what it looks like to you on the screen, represents one student. So there are four, if you counted them, there are 475 dots on that screen. The blue sort of horizontal, I'm sorry, sort of diagonal lines that go up and to the right, those are our growth, that's the growth range. So everything between the blue lines indicates within the expected growth range. So that student falls within the expected growth range if they're between the two blue lines. If they're below the blue lines, they are below the expected growth range or they're in the low growth range at this point. If they're above the blue line, they're in the high growth range at this point. And then the overall um, achievement numbers are, are to the far left, so, so, so the, the vertical axis in, in terms of how high or low we are <laughs> correlates to achievement. So again, this just sort of underscores the idea that we are seeing movement into that lower risk area. We're seeing expected growth in this assessment. We look then at early literacy in kindergarten. Again, here we're seeing a move toward the green in that far right area. Still a slightly higher number of students in the yellow and red than we might want to see at the end of the year. But again, when we look at what does that growth look like, we're still well within the expected growth range. Now, does that mean there are some students who are growing above, ex higher than expected? Yes. And some a few lower than expected? Yes. But overall, we're seeing this moving in a good direction in terms of expected growth right now for the current year. First grade early numeracy, again, here we see very few students, comparatively speaking, in those yellow and red columns, which tracks with the expected growth we're seeing across from the ECRA viewpoint. And then here's our winter first grade early literacy. If you remember, we spent quite a bit of time focused on this grade level last year. So again, we're seeing a good percentage of students in, in the green column. Still, about that's about 20% of students in that red sort of at higher risk column. However, just by comparison, and again, to do this for every metric would create 90 slides, but here's fall of 22. So where we started this year with this initial assessment, we had a much higher percentage of students in, in the red and the yellow. I'll go backwards one than we do now. So we can see that shift over toward green already happening over the course of this year. And again, that tracks in ECRA. And, and here, you know, the overall growth size is 0.19. So we're primarily in expected growth. But if, you, if we were to zoom in on this thing here, we can see we've got 17% of students in the high growth area, but 77 across expected and only 5% in the low growth. And so really that again underscores the work that's happening with everything that we're doing to, to move in the right direction with those metrics. Mm -hmm. yeah. As we shift into the map summary from ECRA, again, this, this slide always just reminds us when are we looking winter of 2022-23 and what assessment we're looking at. So we're looking at map for grades two through eight. And the first slide ECRA always gives us is the aggregate. So across all subjects, we are right in line with expected growth right now. That's a, a whole sea of green, which is, which is great news. That says we are on track. The things we're doing are yielding expected growth across the board in the aggregate for all of our, for all of our buildings across, when we combine both subjects. When we look at math, we start to see a few more colors pop out a little bit. As we indicated, there are a couple of schools where map growth, math growth excuse me, in the map assessment has tipped over into the higher than expected range overall, so that turns those blue. We notice that both Herrick and O'Neill have yellow here in the mathematics growth range, not dramatically so, but both definitely over into that yellow range, which kind of then in the aggregate keeps our math expected growth as a district sort of right on that, almost right at zero. Again, zero being exactly as expected. In reading, we're seeing slightly higher than expected growth across the board. And again, everyone here is well within the expected range. And if we think about you know, all of the presentations you've heard so far, including the presentation from Puffer this evening, we've been hearing about school improvement planning goals in the area of reading. So this is 
a, a more green looking chart than we've seen the past couple of data periods in reading overall. And so it, it stands to reason that the things we're doing through that school improvement planning process are taking hold. It's also um, we would expect that we've still got another half of the year and so we're hoping to see some of those numbers continue to increase as those strategies that have been implemented throughout the course of this year continue to reap benefits. When we look at math by grade level, again, we're going to look at a couple of, of, of um, outliers here a little bit. First of all, if you look at third grade, that's a, a blue dot at plus 0.75. So that's actually, that's, that's even high into that higher than expected growth, and we're going to unpack that a little bit later in the presentation. And then we do acknowledge that seventh, both seventh and eighth grade, so when we looked first, we saw both middle schools had the yellow lower than expected growth for math. We now, this verifies that it actually is both grade levels at seventh and eighth grade in very similar places, lower than expected growth for math. Other than that, our grade levels are in the green. And again, reading, we see again, third grade slightly higher, just tipped over into that, into that blue color, but everybody else at every grade level within expected growth as we look through. And then when we look at subgroups, again, here's one group. Our black student population is showing lower than expected growth in mathematics. Every other comparison to subgroup stays within the expected growth range in math. And the one that's really kind of exciting to look at is within reading, where we sometimes do see some greater discrepancies for certain uh, demographic groups across the board. We're seeing the, 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 the expected growth really mirroring that grade level and building growth across our subgroups. So this is another area of, of, of celebration right now to say that we are not seeing growth gaps among these groups. We are, are, are there still achievement gaps? Certainly there are. But to see that the, that the growth has, has stayed in line is exciting. So what do we do next? Over the past few weeks, building level teams have met, and this really is the first time that every building has used ECRA as the starting point. So a limited number of people in each building have logins and can, can log in and show the data. Classroom teachers generally were very excited and, and, and are eager to get their hands on their own logins to be able to really take a look at their students and, and drill down further with what ECRA <coughs> can do. And that's going to happen over the course of the next three to four weeks so that when we get to the spring benchmarking, really our grade level teachers on, on their own will be able to do some of this initial data review and then come back to the full group. We look across tier one and we really say, okay, where are there places we might need to consider some instructional shifts or redefinitions based on the data we're seeing now for the second half of the year. And of course, we're continuing to look at individual students to see if, if the intervention and additional support we're putting in place is working, is having the desired effect, or if we need to consider some different approach for the second half of the year. The ECRA data combines with progress monitoring data for the majority of those students as well. So one of the questions we get often is, so what, what do we do then when we see a blue dot or a yellow dot, and how do we work through that, right? And so here is our grade three math data. And so one of the things, obviously, that 0.75 in the blue, that tells us that we've got a huge number of students in that high growth range. You know, only 6% in low, but 39% in the high growth range. So then what ECRA makes very easy for us is we can submit, we can click a couple of filters, and then it will show us just those students who are above that blue diagonal line. So who are are those 39% of high growth students. You can see just by looking at the chart that their propensity level and their achievement level varies as we go. So it's not all high achievement, high growth. You can see that, that there are students above the blue line across that chart. So one of the things that is often hypothesized is, well, third grade is the first grade that we accelerate students in math. So is that what's driving that third grade number? And, and it certainly may be a contributing factor, but an initial analysis says that there are, um, there are 57 of those students who are in accelerated math, but the remaining 131 are at grade level math. And so that, you know, that doesn't necessarily say that just because you're accelerated, there are more than 57 students who are accelerated. Obviously, there are more than 131 at grade level, but acceleration may be a contributing factor. Another thing we think about is because that's the first level that we accelerate, it's the only grade level in which students are leaving math block to go up to another class or another place for instruction, but there isn't an influx of students from the grade below. And so what that yields is, frankly, slightly smaller math class sizes in grade three grade level math. And so is that a hypothesis that might have an impact on what instruction looks like? And so that's just sort of that beginning of are there, are there system-wide things or are we getting into specific you know, building level things? What do some of those third grade on grade level math classes look like? And are there things that are happening, di happening differently because they are slightly smaller? So those are the kinds of questions that we begin with as we look at something like this and move forward. Similar. Next question right there. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, 
I, you, you anticipated my question about third grade, so thank you for that. Um, you know, you, you had some hypotheses, and I appreciated the conversation about that. Um, and you talked about like a lot of like you're, you look at the, the kids' data. Um, are, are there conversations around like what are the adults doing differently in the room as well? Because it's not just math; it's also reading. And if you go back to fall, mm -hmm. the, their, their third grade math and reading data was also statistically significant. Um, so, I mean, I. I is there anything that, that like we can conceive of that like these adults are doing differently on like these third grade teams, the professional adult what they're doing together, their their professional learning community communities, whatever, are highly functional or something like that. Is there anything that we, we know about like the teacher practice that might be contributing to this as well? No, that's a great question. And I think that, you know, and I, and to be fair, it's a question we haven't necessarily asked in that way in terms of are there pro, you know, are there specific practices happening in third grade. There are some curricular shifts where resources start, you know, learning there is usually kind of a K2 three five split and so sometimes there's just a, a boost of seeing things in a slightly different way for students. It's a little it can be refreshing, but as we go into grade level meetings this week, that's actually a a, 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 a nice question to share with our third grade teachers as we go through and as we're kind of celebrating this data, you know, talking about what are their own hypotheses about what that is. I, I'll tell you it's, it's challenging to get teachers to say, well, I think I'm pretty great because I do this because there's a lot of humility in the room, which is which we are proud of. But at the same time, I think, you know, it is a good question to say, all right, let's talk about it. Are there things that, that you are finding great success with that we can even scale not only across third grade, but right. to second and fourth and beyond? Right. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. Mm -hmm. So then to look in the other direction, similarly, this is eighth grade across the district winter math data. And so we can see there are a larger number of, of, of students below the blue line than above the blue line, right? And so then it, this is an area where we're going to say, so, you know, who are those students in, in the low growth area? And again, you can see looking across the chart, it, it is not, it, it's all, it's across really all achievement levels. And so one of the nice things, a couple of nice things that ECRA can do for us in this case, one, we can quickly get a, a list of exactly who are those students and it correlates to other data that we have and so in meeting with our middle school principals we talked about how are we gonna how are we gonna approach this how are we gonna start to drill down into what's happening and so at data meetings um, the past two weeks at the middle schools they went through with staff and they, they, they identified each of those really each of the students but especially those in the low growth by student name and by math course and, and looking at you know is this a common core eight problem is this an accelerated problem and, and, the, and the truth is it that very a little bit but it gave the teachers an opportunity to really take a look and say okay who are these students that are in lower than expected growth some of them may already be receiving intervention support for those that aren't are there little things that we can put in place can we leverage some of that student support period to include some additional math practice that we are expecting of these students to kind of you know give a boost in the areas that are being identified as lower than expected growth again this isn't you know this isn't a five alarm fire it's slightly into the yellow but it, it certainly for us is an outlier across the district and so it's a good place to take a look and say what can we do mm -hmm. the other thing ECRA allows us to do is we can create a group within the system for example of just the students who were who demonstrated low growth at this point in time and so then it'll freeze that group of students but it'll also give us all of those comparisons you know all of those numbers and things within that group so when we come back to spring and we do this again we can look not only at all of the eighth grade students in math who would at that time are demonstrating growth in any area but we can also say there were 120 students who were in low growth at this winter benchmark how did that group of students perform form in the spring benchmarking data as a group. So it's another way to really say, yes, we want to know about each one of those individual students, but we can say, we've recognized this, we're, we're trying to put some things in place to help improve that. How did it work for those specific students who are identified as low growth right now? And that's something you can do in ECRA with any group of students you can, that, you, that you choose to select, where you can then kind of freeze that group in time. So we could do the same thing with our third graders who showed high growth in math this time and say, okay, let's see, is it those same kids who are showing high growth next time or what happened to those students as a group as we went through. So there's just so many measures of not only accountability but just of, of, of data insight as we go through to see, again, ECRA's, one of their, their primary focal points is, is what we're doing working? Are the efforts we're putting in place moving the needle? And so there's really a lot of ways for us to take a look at this and then be able to look back at each period and see what that looks like. The last thing I want to highlight is we identified that, that black student group as um, showing a slight gap in terms of math performance. And so this chart, it's a little difficult to see, but this is filtered out all 
all the students except those who are in that subgroup. And so you can see the slightly darker circles then in this chart, the ones that are not gray, are the students in that subgroup. And the reason I show this is just to sort of demonstrate, as we just looked at eighth grade math and sort of where that distribution falls in terms of growth, in eighth grade, it's relatively similar proportionally. Now, we'll notice that, y yes, that achievement gap exists a little bit because we're not seeing as many of those over to the far right right now. But in terms of where the growth distribution lies, it's not entirely disproportionate to the rest of the district. And similarly, in third grade, while we may not be seeing as many students above that blue line proportionally, it's, it's closer in line because there also aren't as many below that blue line. And so as we start to think about, you know, what does that subgroup performance look like, it's just a good reminder that we're talking about 111 students across the district when we're looking at that subgroup. So when you're looking at 111 against 4,800, there are going to be some, you know, a, a handful of students can start to swing that number. So not to say it's not something we need to look at, but this gives me a little bit of reassurance that it's not such a disproportionate distribution than we're seeing just in these two sample grade levels across the district. What's next with data is we'll come back in June with the spring data snapshot in a format very similar to this. And then over the summer, the instructional leadership teams at each building review all of that information. We'll get the IAR data from ECRA if it tracks from last year somewhere in um, late June, early July once it's available to them through Pearson. And then by the time that we finally come back around in October and look both at the fall data and that's when we can do our full on KPI analysis for the prior year. We'll be able to do a little bit of analysis in June around the growth KPI, but the IAR KPI analysis, our, our achievement KPI, is one that we um, solidify in October. Are there any questions? All right, any questions or comments from the board? I, you, go. No, go you go first. No, I guess I want to make a comment. I think I want to celebrate the system. I, I, I think kind of there's been a lot of dialogue um, a lot of utilization of external consultants and a lot of your team's time to get to this point. And I think um, from my vantage point, we actually aren't questioning the data and how we present it. Now we're actually having meaningful conversations and, and to get to the point we're actually talking about subgroups um, from an ethnic perspective. And then we're actually getting to the grade levels. Because I think one thing that continuously comes up is why are seventh and eighth grade outliers, mm -hmm. right? And, and so now we're actually at the point where we're not dismissing the data, we're actually talking about what are we gonna do, what does this actually mean and what are we gonna do about it? And so I, I, I feel like um, the next level of conversation is what are we, what are we gonna do? And then I actually, you know, so my question is ahead of that, that June timeframe from a board perspective, you maybe just give some insight as to how you see um, for example, the seventh and eighth grade building dialogues coming out because I feel like we're still we're at that cusp of of continuing the momentum of of the, the great tone that I like, but I, I still feel like we're still not fully going over, mm -hmm. over the edge to get us to where we need to lean be. For, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So how how are how are we going to lean in on the seventh and eighth grade and other subgroups that are clearly outliers? in the spring and the fall on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. Sure. So again, like at each building level, there were conversations, and again, they've happened over the past three weeks, so I, I'm, I'm not privy to all of them, but around what, what instructional shifts do we need to make? And specifically, 7th and 8th grade, O'Neill and just met this afternoon during today's PLM. Herrick was last week's PLM. So really starting to look at, okay, who are these students, and what can we put in place to acknowledge that these group of students are, are demonstrating low growth right now. We would like to see that change if we can over the next benchmarking period. You know, we won't have new data to look at until June, but we certainly can do a brief report back, whether it's through the updates or, or a brief conversation in terms of what action steps have been taken, what, what you know, what, what have we put in place. Another interesting, I don't have it for both schools, but I know O'Neill today just took a look at within the student support period and those students who are already receiving intervention, really like 90-something percent of students who are receiving reading support and 75 percent of, of students who are receiving math support are demonstrating expected or higher than expected growth. So digging into that too, like we've got some of these structures in place, how do we make that happen? Similarly, you know, we can we can bring some of that back from some of the other elementary schools as well. So I think what I can commit to for sure is over the next, you know, four to five weeks getting into, okay, now that we've had the initial conversations, here are some of the things that are tangibly happening that hopefully will become visible in the June data. I think two things too, in, um, 
to answer your question, Steve, as well, to piggyback off of Justin, that we're very excited about is we're finally in a place where we're down to the individual student level having individual conversations about kids instead of just kids in the aggregate. Um, and again, I don't want to paint a picture like that. Never happened before. But this data by the click of a button allows you to do that. So I think that's really important um, is, is to talk about leaning in a little further. The second thing is what Justin alluded to is as we built this system, the next step is for our individual teachers now to start diving into this and not just get it presented to them, but be able to use that information in their classroom on their own. And so that too will be a different um, track that we go down as we head into the future and, and really start this this spring. So we're excited to report back how that looks and how that's going, especially with PLM Mondays, as we're having teacher directed days and building directed days where they can really sit and have those individual uh, conversations. And even to add to that, a number of teachers had a teacher directed today, day to day where they are deciding mm -hmm. what professional learning, what instructional improvements they're going to happen. As we read through the activities, there were a great number of people who said, I am using winter data to regroup and redes redesign instruction based upon that. So there, there are tangible examples out there for sure. Mm -hmm. So to lean in a little bit further on what Steve brought up um, in reading the slides for tonight, I went back and looked at um, October's fall snapshot and it was the same line of lower than expected growth for 7th and 8th grade and I guess as somebody that has kids in high school and it's like a very short finite amount of time in middle school that we have with them like I feel when we've looked at uh, data for reading in the past we've heard back from you I don't know like okay we or even if, when the schools come in they talk about their SIP plans and they identified the vocabulary for reading was a problem or whatever. I guess it would be, I would enjoy hearing that granularly, like what the buildings at O'Neill and Herrick have, where they've targeted the things that they're gonna work on rather than, do you understand what I, like, mm -hmm. you know, in reading it's easier because you could talk about, in, you know, vocabulary or in, in, instructional text or fictional or non-fiction text or whatever, but, um, for math, we haven't really heard at the granular level what kind of things they can do, and because it is such a short period of time that we have them, and it's been two already, two of these snapshots we've seen that says the same thing, I just, I would love to get more in the weeds with that. Yeah, I think that's um, one of the things that Justin and I had talked about was, if you remember last October when, when the kids were coming back from, you know, different learning models and things, we saw that... Um, data from Ames Web Literacy, you know, we saw a really high number for our first graders, right? And, and the board had rightfully so expressed concerns about, well, why do we think it's that high? What are we doing? And one of the things, we didn't see that, you know, necessarily change overnight. It, it, it took a while, um, but we were able to really sit down with our team of, of reading specialists and our teachers and talk about the different uh, foundational skills that we were going to put in place to hopefully increase that achievement and growth. And so what I'm hearing you ask for is, you know, what does that conversation look like? You know, what are we gonna be focusing in on as a whole uh, with our seventh and eighth graders as we conclude the year and then into next year? And we can certainly, after these conversations have taken place at the building level, meet with our middle school administrators and really talk about those things. Um, you know, is it um, number sense? Is it, you know, uh, automaticity? What, what are those things that they're working on universally? And then of course, what Justin alluded to too, is that student support period that we have after lunch, can we put more kids in, in the right size intervention for them to help increase that? So we can certainly come back and have those conversations. I would, I would in, 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 enjoy that. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Because Justin, I, I think that we've known for years, we've been hearing, uh, we've been having the conversation around middle school math, uh, you know, for a long time, but we couldn't quite get our finger on it. And so we, we purchased a new curriculum then we got kind of hit by COVID. We've now invested in the, in the suite of tools and I will, um, back what Steve said, I think this is an incredible tool set for us and giving us visibility, but also I think for the first time since I've set up here, I know that the aggregate stuff that I'm looking at is the same tool set that is being drilled down and looking at at the individual level. Uh, so yeah, I would, like, I would like to piggyback on the fact that we would like to see, I think, a little bit more drill down on that and, and, and see sort of a, an improvement plan on, on how we focus on that math, because I think we've sort of intrinsically known this, but now we have sort of data to back it up. But I'm also a little curious because uh, seventh and eighth grade and the sixth graders, while they're separated uh, 
in our model here are using the identical um, curricular materials. So what is maybe sixth grade looking like differently? Is it, you know, how much time are we spending on math, you know, in, in sixth grade versus seventh grade? And we just recently kind of tinkered around with the, the middle school schedule. Is, is that where it needs to be right now? When it comes to a core subject like math, is that something that we need to, to reevaluate, you know? Um, I'm just looking at the same curricular materials, the same kind of period of time, um, and the same process here, but we're seeing a, uh, a stronger showing both in what looks like achievement scores and growth scores uh, as opposed to our seventh and eighth grade. So, um, anybody else comments, questions? Um, I have. Oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go first. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm looking into, I, I agree with everything said on seventh and eighth grade, absolutely. Um, I'm also now looking down into the subgroup data and, you know, as you compare third grade to eighth grade, right, and I know the numbers are different in each grade, but, you know, you have, I'll call it the, the lower blue line, right, those below that lower blue line, you've got approximately 20% of students below that blue line in third grade and approximately 50% below it in eighth grade. So. What's happening as they go through the school? Like, do we see, and I know we're not on that yet, but like, if we compare grade to grade data, are we seeing that that number is increasing over time of those who are falling below their proficiency? Or are they, or is it a mix? What are we getting over the time from third through eighth? That's happening, you know, some students I know start, as I'm looking at the numbers here, just between third and eighth, they're starting in the first two thirds, right? And I don't see anyone starting in the second two thirds, right? So, you know, what's happening over time and, and how often are we seeing from when we start to collect the data? Are they, is it growing year over year? Or is it reducing year over year? That's a great question. So, you know, we now have, at the end of this year, we'll have roughly two, two and a quarter years of data with an ECRA. So we'll yeah. be able to, in this platform, really start being able to see that. Mm -hmm. I also, while I concur with all of the questions, and I'm happy to bring back a lot of, of information on middle school math in the next, you know, and we'll figure out when the bet, I don't want to make the workshop next week or in a couple weeks too much longer, but we can definitely find a space <laughs> to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. I also want to remember that this is based on a group of students taking one test on one or two days. Yeah. And so we have to be, and, you know, while there is a yellow dot, there, 60 something percent of our seventh and eighth graders are showing expected or higher than expected growth. So, yes, yeah. it's an anomaly mm -hmm. in our data set, and, and it's worth looking at, and I absolutely will do that. But I think that's the, also the important comparison point is we have, to, we have to take the longitudinal view of some of this. And so I appreciate that question, which is not just about what's today, but what does it look like over the past three or four? Tracy, your, your identification that it looked the same in the fall is accurate. It's also interesting. It's the first time we've ever had that fall growth point. I mean, we had had like three days of instruction before they took that assessment. So it's tricky to say, you know, I'll be interested to see what next falls looks like based on Eckers propensity mm -hmm. scores. It is still, it's exciting and it's, it's comforting, but it's also still new. And so we just have to give ourselves a little bit of space to say, you know, there is, that we don't, we want to be careful that we right size our reaction. I, I agree. Looking at the data, this was exactly, I focused there too, because it is, it is the point that draws our attention compared to everything else that's on the screen. But I think that's that's the other recognition. So the, the, the best answer I have to that question right now, Melissa, is I can't quite answer it yet because we don't sure. necessarily in this system have that longitudinal data. You know, we used to track cohorts by map median percentile, but we didn't track subgroups in that way. So sure. it is something to keep looking at. What is that, what is that starting point? Because really that comes down to are we closing the achievement gap year over year, mm -hmm. not just looking at growth. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. To jump in just a little, what we do see with the NWA test is over time, the younger a kiddo is, the more growth we expect. Mm -hmm. And then as they get older, the less growth we expect. So for instance, an eighth grader in math who's got a RIT score of 240, which is showing geometry readiness skills, we might expect them to grow two or three RIT points where a first grader might be expected to grow 15 points. I'm, I'm overgeneralizing. The other thing too about this particular test, especially with a K2 test, is it's predominantly a test that's read to students, so it's not testing their reading. And so what we do see is numbers that are very high in achievement um, in kindergarten through second grade. As kids then have to read it 
themselves, um, we do see those numbers come back down a little bit, which is pretty typical of any district um, that I've seen. I, I think what we're also looking for, as Justin or just alluded to, is where is the median child in our grade level, the C? How does that stack up against the national norm, right? And, and so those numbers continue to be pretty encouraging as we're looking at that. But certainly, want to continue to look at the middle school. Um, Darren, I think you asked a very, very good question that we're asking as well. You know, if that same curriculum is present in sixth grade, how does it vary between seventh and eighth? And, and that is certainly something that we're going to continue to dive into. Yeah, I mean, a, a quick answer to that is like 35 minutes more in sixth grade by our structure, you know? And so that is, as we look at long-term middle school scheduling and what does that look like? Our middle school class periods are 45, 46 minutes. Mm -hmm. our, our elementary math block is 80. And so the students who are receiving sixth grade instruction in Big Ideas are receiving, there is more instructional time devoted just by the nature of the structure. And so, you know, that's one of the things that this is a preview of a conversation for next year. But as we look at the, the long-term middle school schedule, you know, we devote twice as much time to reading and writing as we do to math and so that's one of the things that as the scheduling committees have met over the years we've begun to think about different ways to construct a schedule but that that gets way down into the weeds that we'll save for later but just as an initial response to that there, there is a there is a difference by our own structure of what mm -hmm. that looks like right and I know we've had a couple of conversations around it and I know we've made some adaptations um, to that schedule but uh, looking <coughs> at these numbers I think this is going to be something that we have to continue to, to tweak and make sure that the adjustments that we're making are in line I know that uh, Vice President Harris previously was concerned about some of the moves that we were making um, impacting the amount of instructional time that kids have on some of the core subjects. And so uh, it, I just noticed that that obviously is the same curriculum between sixth and seventh and eighth grade. And if that curriculum is designed to be consumed in a longer period of time, uh, you know, not 45 minutes, but closer to 80 minutes, then, it, then it's a lot harder to get the lessons across as opposed you know so mm -hmm. is it the right especially as we're going to move sixth grade in, into the middle school if they're going to follow that same format uh, I know we're going to be we haven't had this material long but it's something that we're going to have to continue to evaluate I think on, the, sure. on the product so I just want to bring it real quick back to the subgroup conversation though because I wasn't talking maybe longitudinal data because I know we don't have that yet but okay. we do have how is third grade performing fourth fifth sixth right each individual grade level right now are we seeing that those numbers are consistently where we're seeing in third grade and eighth grade right yeah, okay, I see. Is that consistent? Yes, the, the, third, grade, fourth the, fourth grade, the fourth grade. third and the eighth grade were a sample to demonstrate the, the correct. Yes, the, yeah, the, the, in, in, that, in that case, yes. the, distri yeah, the distribution across grade levels is not vastly different mm -hmm. than, the, okay. than the general population. Okay, so we're not seeing a big jump. Correct. Between grade level to grade level. Okay. Correct. That, that was where I was. Thank right you. Now. Sorry. I'm yeah. sorry for missing that. I was like, I know we don't have, but each of these <laughs> little dots represents a you know, real person student, and I just want to make mm -hmm. sure that you know, we're, we're getting them, moving them upward mm -hmm. through time. Correct. One of the things that uh, I'll piggyback off of what Steve said we should be celebrating is the fact that we're able to look at this data at this altitude and this granularity. Uh, we should also celebrate our subgroups' performance in reading mm -hmm. uh, across the board. It's a huge win for us as a district. It's not consistently that way. Uh, and so I uh, want to celebrate that because I know the amount of focus we've put on that subject area. You just named the disproportionate amount of time we spend on reading and writing relative to mathematics. Uh, one of the things that I'd love to get some thoughts on, especially with our partnership with ECRA, and you and I have talked about this, but I'll, I'll say it for um, uh, because we're talking about winter data. Um, there's an opportunity, I think. We are not the only district that sees an opportunity for black students to have stronger growth outcomes. Uh, this is a nationwide nationwide pandemic has been the, has been the case for decades. What I think this unique opportunity in this moment in time brings us is we are partnered with an uh, organization like ECRA that does this across hundreds of districts. I would be surprised if the vast majority of those districts didn't have the same challenges we do. I imagine they do, but I would be surprised if there weren't some districts in that data set that are themselves outliers relative to others, both on low performance and on high performance. And so what I think there's an opportunity to do and potentially an opportunity for us as a district to lead is to identify what are the places where we see subgroups that are outperforming the national average, whether they be females in math, whether it be black students, Hispanic students, Asian students, whatever it might be, ELL students. What are the places where we're seeing that there are practices in individual districts like we are, where we're seeing all of our subgroups meeting expected growth in reading, which I think should be looked at 
by other districts? Where can we look externally to be able to identify where are subgroups performing and outperforming? And what's happening at those districts? Are they devoting twice as much time to mathematics as they are to reading? Which is our story on the opposite side, right? With uh, reading and writing uh, emphasis. Um, or is there uh, more uh, you know, individuals and in uh, uh, staff that look and feel like the students that they're teaching? Um, are there practices that they do with how they decide which intervention program they provide with, with which students? I think there's an opportunity to do that, and I'd love our, uh, to see if ECRA would be interested in a partnership like that, or just helping us think through which school districts or data points to look at to be able to help us understand our data a little bit better when it comes to subgroups. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. ECRA's initial response to a question similar to that is essentially you'll have to ask those districts, and I don't mean to, to paraphrase it facetiously, but that they're not necessarily in, the, in, the, in a space where they can share analysis of other districts' data with us, even in general terms. However, they host several workshops throughout the course of the year, um, typically in the fall and in, the, in like May, June, July, when they're processing all the data, where many districts do come together at the ECHO offices up in Schaumburg. And James and I have attended most of those that have been available since we began our partnership. So you know, if we're, if we're looking at a place where could we lead that conversation and start to bring some people in, I think we can certainly attend that next opportunity with a focus on just walking around and, and, and asking, OK, you know, do you have some, some subgroup data, or here's an area Area we're looking at are you you know and just beginning some of those conversations because that really is also part of the purpose of those workshops is networking among other ECRA districts so I'm certainly happy to, to bring that to Schaumburg next time we head up thanks and just to piggyback off of that one of the things and Justin doesn't know this yet because I haven't had time to talk to him yet today about it um, I serve on the uh, ROE superintendent steering committee and Dr. Rochetti is working with all of our districts to find those pockets of success particularly centered around equity and student achievement and to see do we have those pockets of success and instead of just having these one-off districts here or there throughout the county, how can we leverage that more in a county-wide model? So when we go to things like the Countywide Institute Day, we're all hearing the same success stories or we're all hearing the same challenges and how we build off of that. And so one of the things that Darlene is really trying to put in place and turn over to Amber Cork when she takes over is that county-wide approach because we have a lot of really high achieving school districts who are doing great work right in our backyard and I would throw us right at the top of that list, but we can all learn from each other and how can we be better coordinated as superintendents and assistant superintendents throughout the county. Um, we have our working groups now, but really putting an emphasis on, on questions like you're asking, I think can go a long way. And so those are conversations that we're also having at the county-wide level, in addition to some of the other network opportunities that Justin's referencing. Thanks. <clears throat> other comments or questions? Thank you. Fantastic work. Thank you. One last Thank one. You, uh, in the in the transparency, he was asking questions about. We are relatively transparent with a lot of this data that we put out there. How typical is that of, of school districts around us, uh, in, in what they do? I'm going to hesitate to answer that question with a comparison. I think you know certainly as you as you poke around on websites, you can find, find reports similar to this. Okay. Um, I think you know there is you know Kevin alluded to some of the networks. There is a the curriculum directors network in DuPage County, which includes a lot of us, is is pretty open about sharing when people survey things, and yet. Once the pandemic hit, people got a little more hesitant to just openly share data because it did look so different depending on a lot of factors. And so, sure. you know, I, I, I think it's a lot of that is, is truly hunting and pecking kind of work to try to find in board agendas, in, you know, in district websites and things like that where you're going to see it, which is part of the reason so often the conversations default to IAR because it's the one thing right. that we can immediately find and compare. So, I just want to thank the board. Um, Speaking of transparency and, and vulnerability and those things, I, I think one of the reasons why certain districts don't put out information is because if they put it out and it shines a bad light in a particular area, they get their hands slapped so hard that people go, okay, I'm never going to do that again, right? And I'm only going to share, share the success stories. That is not something that we've committed to. We want it all out there because as Melissa just talked about, each one of those dots is somebody's kid in, in wanting to make sure that they're successful. When we talked about this framework and we talked with our teachers, you know, certainly we are going to shine lights on pockets of success and we are going to shine lights on, on growth opportunities, but we use it to always get better in the continuous improvement cycle. And this conversation was a great example of that. And so we thank you as the administrative team because that helps facilitate really good conversations at the building level. And that's something that we always want to continue to do with our great teachers. Thank you, Justin. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Next up is reports to the board. Up first, Dr. Russell, superintendent. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Well, first off, I want to start off by just saying a special thanks to our Henry Puffer students, staff, and family members for their presentation tonight. Mark, your team did a great job, and it was great seeing uh, Henry Puffer represented tonight at our uh, school board meeting. I also want to thank uh, the 100 plus staff members and 100 plus uh, community members that attended our two visioning sessions on facilities at O'Neill. Um, really, really positive feedback, great forward thinking conversations. I know Amy uh, from White & Company was a, a, you know, a big designer of that. So Amy, I want to uh, thank you just for all of your hard work and Megan Hewitt and Melissa as well for all of their work. It was a really, really impactful night in the district. A um, lot of positivity, a lot of energy uh, moving forward. So we want to thank everyone uh, for sacrificing that time and coming out. It was cold that night too, so we really appreciate it. Uh, in terms of personnel, we've completed the process for the selection of the O'Neill Middle School principal. I know our uh, candidate is here, and we're going to announce that here in a little bit. Uh, but we're also in the middle of the selection process for Justin's replacement for the Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. And we hope to have a candidate recommendation to the board either at the curriculum workshop on February 27th or at the latest uh, the March meeting, but certainly hoping for that curriculum uh, workshop. Uh, Jane and I will be continuing the interview process process uh, this week. In terms of curriculum and instruction, uh, two weeks from tonight, we look forward, as I shared, uh, to hosting a curriculum workshop at O'Neill Middle School. We're excited to return to the format that we used prior uh, to COVID, in which the board, administrative team, and audience members will rotate through several classrooms to learn from District 58 teachers. We'll focus on social studies and inquiry, dual language, elementary music, middle school advisory, and our writing pilot. This truly gives us an opportunity uh, to dive in deeper and get some tangible understanding uh, of what the student experiences are in our school district, especially around things that the Curriculum Council is currently working through with our teachers. And so we're excited for that. I also want to thank Justin ahead of time because I know that's a lot of work for not only Justin, uh, but for his entire team. Uh, under finance, you'll see the results uh, from the auditor, uh, the letter, and you'll also see our response to that. So if anybody's interested in digging a little deeper, uh, all things audit are also in board docs uh, tonight. In terms of technology, this is something we want to uh, celebrate. I won't get too far in the weeds uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I'm not James, and he does a much better job. And once I get too far in the weeds on some of this stuff, it quickly goes over my head. Uh, however, we are uh, shifting from paying for our fiber uh, lines to having that inside. Uh, James was able to secure a grant and uh, that work is ongoing. If you remember, it was supposed to be in place by the end of this year. That process has already been accelerated. And so you're gonna start to see some of those monthly bills come off, uh, which we're very, very excited about. Next fiscal year, we expect a recurring annual savings of over $75,000, uh, thanks to that uh, stuff coming offline. That is certainly not chump change, and James, I really want to thank you for that. Um, when he proposed that idea, all cards on the table, I was a little nervous about uh, doing this on our own, uh, but he really did a nice job uh, working with the various vendors, securing it for free, and uh, making sure that if something does go wrong, we've got a great support network in place there. And so. Uh, very excited about that and uh, it, again it just shows how we're going to continue to look for grants and opportunities to uh, reduce our costs because we always have to add in the school district and so how do we take some things off the other side so thank you James for that. In terms of student services the district's gold rated Grove Children's Preschool will host its open house this Wednesday February 15th from 5 to 6 30 at Henry Puffer. Prospective parents and guardians may tour the preschool, meet the staff, hear an overview of the program, and ask questions. We encourage any interested family to attend. Additionally, preschool tuition applications for the 23-24 school year, excuse me, will open on Wednesday, February 22nd at 8 a.m. In terms of facilities, you're gonna see some things on the construction consent agenda tonight. Uh, Two of the things are going to contain approval for playgrounds at two of our locations. We expect uh, to bring several more locations to the March meeting. I'd like to thank all the parents and students for all of their time and efforts really organizing and fundraising and doing some of those things. We heard Henry Puffer. Uh, they were kind of one of the leaders early on in this work in the school district. And so really by the end of this year, pretty much all of our schools, and when I say end of this year, I'm talking end of the summer, uh, will have updated playgrounds, which is something that uh, we're very, very excited about. I know Kevin Bardo over there. Uh, it's a ton of work and so Kevin we want to thank you and then obviously we want to thank Representative Van Stava Murray for helping secure all that money through grants and then of course the PTAs for matching uh, so many of those funds in the separate playground committees. In terms of public relations, the Education Foundation of District 58 thanks everyone who attended last month's sold out Harlem Wizards basketball fundraiser at Downers Grove South. Uh, 
We had over 2,000 people uh, there. I know uh, Member Joshi and Member Ellis were able to be there that night along with several other people. Uh, it was just a lot of fun and um, the coaching wasn't too, too bad. We, we held our own, but uh, <laughs> the Harlem Wizards did beat us. Uh, but this was certainly a, a really good thing for the community. You can just tell that the community was looking for an event like that and uh, just a, a, a lot of fun. Um, on a related note, the Education Foundation is gearing up for its spring programming. So today the foundation opened the 2023 Select 58 application for our middle schoolers. Select 58 is a recognition program that honors District 58 eighth graders uh, for their service to their school and community. Applications are due on March 10th and more information is available at dg58.org and we'll have that night uh, later in May. In addition, the foundation will launch its annual Distinguished Service Award application honoring exceptional staff later this month. And so we want to thank uh, Megan for working with the foundation and getting all that out. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? Okay. That brings up the monthly business and treasurer's report. Todd Rayfall. Well, Kevin uh, mentioned the management letter that is in the uh, in the items uh, that finishes up that audit piece and goes through those. We're actually meeting with uh, the auditor tomorrow uh, as we are planning the account structure for all of the capital work. Um, and that has to roll out by site so that we have it when we go into the fixed asset reports at the end of you know project uh, projects. So continually working on those pieces. Um, you have a year to date report. Things are moving along uh, accordingly. I always like because we start to look at comparisons uh, on the expenditure side. I always feel I need to point out that in the Ed Fund, it's 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 trailing above where previous years. But again. We have the $1.4 million or $1.6 million in laptops uh, purchases that happened in the summer that were in there, uh, which uh, out of that in the supply account, that's um, part of that $3.8 million that really kind of pushes that up. Overall, um, on, on uh, revenue side, we are uh, doing well. It's, um, it's an interesting piece looking at the capital uh, fund, knowing that we have had the bond proceeds for 32 days. Uh, any interest income that is is coming in for that, and obviously that those funds are planned and projected for uh, that capital work uh, that is going to start coming uh, shortly. So, uh, other than that, in the year re year to date report, we have some action items this evening. Uh, there's a copy lease a copier lease amendment uh, to add to the copiers. It's once we add all the copiers in, we need to make some adjustments, including we. Uh, moved the uh, one of our second copiers from uh, uh, the district office to one of the schools to assist there and so that's a replacement in that um, school fees are on there uh, and that was discussed last month with the board uh, and this is the time of the year where the board approves uh, the annual resolution to transfer the working cash funds over the ed fund uh, for the period of time <coughs> that the ed fund uh, starts to run low so we have our own internal bank uh, that exists. Um, we get ready to do that in March. Uh, and then uh, once uh, the early tax money comes in, uh, those funds are repaid before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, other than that, if there are any questions. Questions, Kevin? Thank you, Deb. Thank you. That brings us to the committee reports. Uh, the policy committee did not meet. Uh, but the legislative committee did meet. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Member Ellis. Um, so, the legislative committee met to discuss the legislative breakfast, which was held. Um, I know it's the next report. So, um, finalize the questions for that and the format for that. Uh, thank you to everyone who put that together. It was a lot of work, um, and uh, the community was really engaged, and the legislators were great to have there. Um, I'm sure Member Ellis is going to. Are you going to give the breakfast report? Oh, I don't care. Yeah. If you'd like. Yeah, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah, yeah no, I, gave, I gave the speech. You can <laughs> thank, you thank you for that, by the way. Yeah, no saved me. Um, yeah, no, the breakfast we held it on February 3rd in the morning. Um, it was, I thought, very, very well attended. We had a large number of legislators that were there, and they all did an amazing job of sharing their, their views and their thoughts, and a lot of community members who came out, and, um, you know, in the small group discussion, section especially I thought there was really great engagement in the table discussions and people were very happy to contribute and share thoughts and 
um, dialogue back and forth very respectfully, and it, I thought it was great. I, you know, we got, I, I know we've already gotten some feedback from some people just saying how, how they thought it was just a great event, and they really enjoyed the time to be able to have those small discussions. So I thought it was, it went off very, very well, and I would echo what uh, Melissa said, you know, thank you so much to everyone who worked so hard. I know Megan and Melissa Jervis do so much to help get that event off mm -hmm. the ground. So thank you guys so much for all your hard work year after year to make that come together. That's not easy, so much appreciated. Great. Any questions or comments? Excellent job as always. We really appreciate it. All right. Uh, the Financial Advisory Committee has not met, neither has the District Leadership Team or the Health and Wellness Committee. So that brings us up to our one discussion item tonight. Justin's already on his way back up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. This he had a couple be, breaks for a This one will be too, brief by comparison. Um, <laughs> so we're excited tonight to, to talk about the possibility of full-day kindergarten, obviously a priority identified for quite a long time. It was actually the February of 2015 curriculum workshop where the O'Keefe plan was presented by our administrative team and kindergarten team to the Board of Education, which was then approved in March. And so we're on a, just a, you know, a nine years later, slightly earlier in, in the process timeline of talking, hopefully, tonight about the process toward full day kindergarten with a hope that we might be able to approve that and be able to move forward for next year so tonight we're going to just spend a moment Todd's going to talk just briefly about the financial feasibility around full day kindergarten as that has obviously been one of the hurdles we've had to overcome for several years and then we'll talk a bit about some of the pre-planning we've been doing around instruction and what that will look like and then briefly around you know what the requirements are regarding a half day program and then finally we want to give time for board discussion so that if there is any additional information or anything that we can can bring back to the curriculum workshop on February 27th to help further inform your decision, we'll be able to do that. So, Todd, your slide is next. <laughs> Got too comfortable. Uh, there are essentially several uh, revenue sources that uh, will help uh, in eliminating the uh, O'Keefe format. Um, one is the large piece is the property tax uh, increase due to the downtown TIF uh, liquidation or, or uh, closure. Uh, fiscal year 24 is the first full fiscal year where the district receives full benefit of those property taxes. Our tax levy is split between two fiscal years, um, 24 being the first year where, where we have full credit plus and then that compounding fact of the, you know, the next year. Uh, also, um, we have been very fortunate in the last couple, uh, the corporate personal property replacement tax, um, which was established in the 1970s when personal property was eliminated by the state of Illinois um, on corporations, thus the name. Uh, that has increased substantially over time. Um, in the last three years, it has gone up. Um, we would four years ago received $800,000. This year, we're at $2.6 million. Uh, so that revenue source uh, also is a, a strong piece for assisting in coverage of this, uh, of this piece. Uh, interest income, you know, as we noted, has, and as if you've seen in the year to date, uh, given the format that we're at, you know, where we're at with the in interest, with the uh, significant increase in interest income, uh, that is going to help out. Additionally, at a lesser level, uh, certainly the fact that right now kindergarten at a half day is half the f fee rate, uh, registration fee, as um, case uh, uh, for first through sixth. If the board would go through and approve this, uh, the kindergarten would be at the same um, fee rate as, as first grade uh, through six, and that would obviously have an additional, it's about a $50,000 increase on an annual basis. Um, there is also some impact on the evidence-based funding model by the state state board, uh, and that may even be somewhere close to that fifty thousand. Uh, I don't know yet, but at a half-day kindergarten, um, the students are 0.5 instead of a 1.0 FTE. So obviously, that doubles up our kindergarten numbers when the evidence-based funding model is calculated on the annual basis. So those are the four areas of revenue increase. A revenue that would help offset uh, that corp that uh, O'Keep uh, fee that has been in place uh, for the last seven nine years. So um, 
this year we're estimating about the upkeep to come in about eight hundred thousand um, dollars. We have more and more waivers in that um, of people who are eligible for that, and so that revenue stream would also, you know, has been down from what we initially would have projected. Uh, so the the delta from twenty three to twenty four is a little bit less uh, than you know our initial projections earlier. Questions on this slide? What's what's the takeaway? You just kind of told us a lot of stuff, right? Takeaway is that we have we're in a good position, particularly because we were able to wait for that full piece of that that tax increment. That increment is a, is a good million plus two million uh, increase in in the property tax overall because of that large amount of new property, uh, and that is essentially what is covering and being able to afford the full day kindergarten uh, in that replacement of that tuition piece. The so other pieces help cover, you know, any shortfalls. So I'm, so I'm oversimplifying it. TIF equals funding available. Yes, for I, I think basically the way we look at yes. this is okay. because the TIF we had to do without for 20 plus years and we had to make sacrifices in other areas. Now that the TIF is rolled off, it's made other things like full day kindergarten possible. What these numbers are also trying to demonstrate is we wanted to be very careful that we didn't start something that we would have to take away. Take we also wanted to be very careful that we didn't start something and have to go back and not be able to meet our contractual obligations or have to cut other areas. And so with these other ancillary things that Todd is mentioning, we feel very comfortable. You know, there's never a crystal ball 10 years down the road or 20 years down the road. But given where our budget is with the increase in TIF funds and in settling contracts, we feel we're in a very good spot to move forward. And we don't have to do without in this particular area anymore because the TIF is now rolled off. Thanks for and answering my aggressive question. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think that was aggressive. Yeah. aggressive. Yeah. So I've, seen, I've seen more aggressive than me. Yeah. Yes. And I don't want to be aggressive either. Um, so at the risk of being aggressive, I'll just, I'll just kind of <laughs> wonder out loud. So, yeah. you know, three years ago, our investment revenue, two years ago, our, our investment revenue just slowed down to a trickle. Mm -hmm. um, CPPRT is, is going gangbusters right now, but an economic slowdown could impact that negatively. Um, and I understanding what we just said about the TIF piece really being um, the biggest piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. for, for funding the, OK, or the full day kindergarten program, um, what if? What if we, we start seeing those other two significant revenue sources starting to be negatively impacted by economic conditions? I mean, I know that's a really, that's a really yeah, hard no, question to answer I, I like on, the, on the fly like that, but like, is it, I, I, what, sure. what you just said, once this horse is out of the barn, we can't, it's not going back in. Once we offer the community full day kindergarten, we can't just say in five years, oh man, it's, it, these are, these are, we're in financial dire straits, mm -hmm. sorry. Like, I just wanna make sure that we don't put ourselves in a position where we would have to consider some other kind of draconian measure in order to um, make up for a significant loss of revenue in those two areas I was speaking of. Well, we so know that interest revenue is not gonna stay where it's no, at. No, we're not, we're not relying on interest revenue in order to finance this. And, right. and so these are very fair questions. They're questions that I would be asking if I were in your shoes. I, I think one of the points that all this other revenue we're, we're trying to demonstrate is, you know, we're seeing huge increase in cross across the board because of, um, you know, inflation, supply chain issues, all of those things, right? This is how we're helping keep up with some of those other costs. To your point, Greg, as you start to see inflation slow down and interest rates, you know, get back to, to kind of normal where, where we've seen them before, you know, some of those other costs will also go down as those other things go down. We wanted to be very careful though that when we were looking at full day kindergarten, that we were able to do it in the current structure with the increase in revenue from the TIF. Um, all this other stuff that you see up here, that we're all to dry up tomorrow, we still feel we'd be in a really good spot to, to offer full day uh, kindergarten. We'll be um, in a good I spot. Maybe not really good <laughs> spot, but good spot. <laughs> well, that's the difference between the superintendent <laughs> and the business manager. Um, but one of the things that I, I will continue to say is that we still have to be conscious as a school district just because we're adding full day kindergarten doesn't mean that we can continue to add this or that or you know you cannot continue to grow 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 and never take anything off of the plate so as we go forward we are still going to have long-term conversations about things and and this is one thing that all school districts need help with right we tend to add things 
but we don't tend to take things away, right? Because once something comes into a school district, that, that's a person behind it, right? And that's, that's how we've done that. And, and so we don't want to take that away. But we have to be willing to have conversations along the way about sustainability and other programs. But um, again, we feel very comfortable with the TIF funds. And that's why we waited for the full revenue to come in from the TIF before we made this recommendation. Now, Todd, with the TIF, we, we've been talking about the TIF since I got on the board, right? And uh, sort of the anticipation of coming in now, I, I think we were worried about really double and triple dipping into it because at one point we didn't know that we would be able to have uh, a successful referendum. Um, and we were, we were afraid that we were going to have to start taking that funding and putting it to the side to do some of the, the, the capital uh, needs. I'm assuming that that referendum has taken some of the pressure off that TIF. Is there anything else that, that is sort of really dependent on that, on that TIF component? Um, in there, our five-year project, you know, we have right, these five-year projections. You know, when we first looked at the TIF rolling off and what that increase would be above our normal uh, property tax growth, there are two areas we focused on in the, in, the, in that five-year projection planning, uh, both previous years and then obviously what we're working on uh, to present to the board later uh, this spring. Uh, one is continual work for put, of putting money towards capital on an annual basis. Uh, in that transfer format that is cert that is in the budget um, uh, for this year and, and then going forward, and then also the the, the all day kindergarten piece. So having um, that referendum pass, you're able to then look at this piece of using that TIF that that differential that increment towards this programming piece to help you know in this aspect, as opposed to having to hold it back and dedicate two plus million dollars two and a half million dollars a year into capital funding and transfer um, because the district is at its capacity at borrowing right. uh, or you know and the, and the large amount of work to be done and then uh, to sort of join in with with Greg um, what do you see is the stability of the future of the CPPRT kind of is this a trend that you think is looking to hold or <laughs> is this going to be an anomaly sort of in this bulk of online ordering and distribution be, centers everywhere and stuff like that. It'll be interesting. I, I, I looked up some quick numbers. So in fiscal year 2018, on a, on a statewide basis, it was $1.2 billion, 19, 1.3, 20, 1.4. Remember, this is all during COVID. Uh, 21, 1.8, 22, $4 billion. Now, could these and, and, and the ratios and percentages as to where it goes was set in 1976, 1977. Um, and so we get the same portion of whatever this is. So the 22 number is what we received this year. Even if that goes down to half, we're still above where we were, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, it is, I think in so many ways, the replacement of a lot of brick and mortar stores where people used to buy things and replaced by corporate structure that is delivering you to your doorstep uh, and paying into a different tax piece than local sales tax. So the CPPRT comes at the expense more often than not of local municipal tax sales tax and goes into the state coffers because it's large corp larger corporation structure that is having and driving that revenue and that money is going into a different piggy bank and then gets distributed in this manner. So it really is a shift of how people buy in so many ways and how people are and how business is getting done um, as opposed to recession or not because certainly a lot of things, these were going up exponentially at time, you know, when um, a lot of things were shutting down. So uh, the interesting come, remember, as we keep with that 35% fund balance piece, fund balance grows and even if it, you know, those interest rates come down a bit, we still have a larger base that we're being able to drive that piece um, and help and, and keep those funds. So that still, it may come down some over the next couple of years, but it's still going to be at a better level or a healthier level uh, than it had been previously. Okay. And so that's, that's one of the other things that we're a little happy, yeah, we're, we're confident about. I also want to thank Todd, but one of the things that the FAC and Todd really were instrumental in doing is that five-year financial plan. 
in, to really be able to look out not only a year or two, but you know, three, four, five years has helped us with our planning too as an administrative team um, to be careful what we commit to because you have to show that sustainability right off the bat, otherwise it can't go forward. And so um, it's a challenging piece, certainly, and it's, it can be a limiting piece, but it really does help make financial uh, decision-making, uh, I think, a much better process. And this was included in that? And this was included in that, yes. Any other comments or questions? We're, we haven't even... <laughs> no, no, no. Before oh, we yeah, more. back... Before I'm going to leave. Yeah. Okay. This is just the financial the side. There's more. Yeah. <laughs> There's only a few more. <laughs> yeah. So back to the fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it, we've been running half day kindergarten plus O'Keep for nine years, and so in a sense, we, we've had many students in school full day, and yet it isn't just the flip of a switch. We really wanted to have some conversations around making sure that we can do this well in the fall uh, with the amount of time we have. And, and in talking with a, a group of about 15 of our kindergarten teachers met voluntarily three or four times after school, we worked through it with our administrative team, it's a resounding yes. Everyone's excited. There's a lot of positive energy around this. One of the, one of the biggest shifts is really going to be the ability to structure the day as a true full day so we don't have to pack all of the core academics in before 1130 and then the developmentally appropriate play-based learning and things like that all after lunch. Being able to spread that out across the day, being able to unpack more of our core curriculum that's there, but also being careful that this doesn't become first grade light. That was a definite concern of our kindergarten team is that we want kindergarten to remain kindergarten and have those, those play-based experiences that, that really are a core part of learning. There are things in O'Keefe we want to keep. There are, there are some really cool activities that have been developed around STEM and exploration and, that the, and poetry that we want to hang on to. We also want to make sure that we're developmentally appropriate in design, looking at you know having the appropriate number of recesses and, and breaks for unstructured play for learners at that age. Also recognizing we can now schedule things, like I said, just without the constraints that we used to have. The, the, the team, the administrative team, the kindergarten team is just super excited about the positive impact for our students and, and, and just sort of the way we can actually kind of take a breath in our day. And if we don't finish something before 1130 that's okay we don't have to try to feel like we didn't get to it we can we can actually pick it up after lunch in that scenario the other piece that's interesting is though while kindergarten is not legally required if you have kindergarten you must offer half day kindergarten and that is just a school code ism that is out there in talking to, to districts that have made this transition years past their what they share is now having gone through it for a while there are a handful of, of families who still opt for uh, half-day programming and typically by this point in the school year they actually mostly opted into full-day programming. It's hard for us to know especially in the first transition year what that's going to look like. Today there are 40 students who do not, who are kindergarten students who do not attend O'Keep across the entire district out of about 475. Difficult to know if that's a philosophical choice or if that's if those are families who are kind of on the bubble of not eligible for waivers but not necessarily able or, or willing to afford the tuition payment in that way. So what we need to do is find out what what next year's registration will look like. So before we cross the bridge of exactly what a half day offering would be, we want to make sure we gauge the level of interest. So as we go through kindergarten roundups and registration, we're certainly going to emphasize we want to first build a strong full day program because we do believe the vast majority of our families are going to elect that program. But we also, and then we'll, we'll wait and see what the response level is. If it's a couple of families within neighborhood schools, that will be instructive. If, if it is an, a large enough number to consider a district-wide cohort or two, then that's something we can go in to and talk about as we as we go further so I mean really those are essentially the two options one would be you attend in the morning at your neighborhood school the other would be we come up with some sort of a centralized location and we'll wait to see what the interest looks like before we really fully define that part again our emphasis right now will be on articulating the what the full day program will look like and so moving forward uh, we hope to bring this before the board for a potential action item at the curriculum workshop which will become a special meeting we need to let isby know by march 1st if we are intending to move to a full day system it's an intent so if something were to change we could it's not i don't want that deadline to feel like we're backing the board into any kind of a corner but as todd mentioned that evidence evidence-based funding model funding comes through that process so we need to let isby know by march 1st that we've had that conversation and then it would just move forward with talking about it shifting the focus of kindergarten around 
wound up onto that full day programming and a focus of beginning it in August of 23. Certainly there are still some other internal instructional things that we'll be talking about. The kindergarten team meets together um, a week from Thursday and we'll begin talking about that with the entire grade level. We've got some time identified at one of the institute days as well to have some just some focused time on planning for that instruction. But again, the, the teachers are, in a, and a few of them are here tonight, I, I believe, in support of this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of positive energy behind getting this work done and making it happen. Fantastic. All right, questions, comments? Thanks for this, Justin. Uh, I fully support moving, moving in this direction. A question for you about half-day kindergarten is, you know, state law requires us to offer it if we do offer a full-day program. Would that then continue to require us to do the core programming of core subject areas still in the morning, or you just have to offer a half-day program and students can leave early even if they don't meet all the standards during those three-hour period? The latter is correct. So it would not, it would not require us to offer that, that format if there were to be one or two students at a particular school who were half-day enrolled. We would, you know, we'd, we, would, we would work to create the best half-day program we could, but it would, we, we would not necessarily revert back into that O'Keefe model. That's not a requirement. The only requirement is that you offer a half-day option. The requirements of what is within that half-day is, is, are not spelled out by ISB. Typically what you see is, is districts will share the schedule with any family that's electing a half day option, you know, at the beginning of the year or curriculum uh, night and then, you know, let them know kind of where we'll be at in particular units and, and allow them access to materials and things like that. Um, there will always be families that don't exercise the full day kindergarten option, but my experience in my previous district running a full day kindergarten program is that over time, that number really dwindles down to only a, a handful of students for usually some pretty specific reasons. Um, and, and again, we're down to 40 students overall approximately right now, um, and that's with a tuition-based program. So we, we are expecting that number to go down. A couple of comments and a question. Um, first of all, I think this is amazing. We've been hearing for years from the community that this is something they would be interested and supportive of, and I'm really glad that you spent so much time soliciting feedback from the kindergarten teachers on their thoughts and how this would impact the way they are able to teach. And I think that's amazing that they are on board and that we've been able to kind of, you know, gain their insight into how it would look. Um, I also think what you talked about in terms of the structure of the day for kindergarten is going to be a huge advantage for these students. You know, we talked earlier about instructional minutes and how much can we time, you know, time can we devote to certain subjects and all those different types of things. I think especially for our younger students, it's so hard to try to have to cram that into a half day when these are kids who need to get up and move every 10 minutes and they need to, you know, we know how kindergartners are. So I think this is going to be so advantageous for just the entire curricular structure, not only for the more academic subjects, but also for, like you talked about, these play-based, you know, kindergarten type things that we don't want to take away we want to still be able to expand on those things for them in a lot of ways because there's so many learning opportunities and developmental benefits to all of those play-based things that we can expand on for a full day program with them on top of the academic thing so I think that's amazing um, my question um, is around special programs in kindergarten I know um, that in the past even when we had O'Keefe as an option that was not um, typically available for kindergarten students in our special programs like BEST and DLP and RISE. And so I'm curious how that's going to impact special programs if we're now having this as a full day option. I'm going to turn to Jessica and let her speak to that. <laughs> I think one, one point on that, I think that's really great, and I think you're right in that every student obviously is so different, especially in those in the specialized programs, but um, I think one advantage also of being able to intersperse less academic type things, those are the perfect type of activities to begin to allow those students in special programs to um, 
join in with the general education classrooms as opposed to academic subjects where it's typically more challenging for them. So to allow them to have more opportunities throughout the course of the day as opposed to there's no opportunity in just in the morning when those students were typically there for kindergarten. It was much harder to have them push into the gen ed classrooms when it was all academic subjects. Whereas mm -hmm. if there are opportunities throughout the day where there's less academic focus activities, they can push into those activities and be a part of the class and yeah. start to um, feel comfortable in those environments. And so I think that's great. And I, I think, I hope we can expand on that and mm -hmm. make that an opportunity for those kids as well. That's a great point, both for specialized programs and for students in kindergarten who are receiving supports through an IEP or 504 or other planning where now again that can be stretched out throughout the day and not so very concentrated. And just to go one further on that, it gives us so many more opportunities throughout all the other grade levels because when you're not having to assign your resource team just to the morning or, or just to the certain time, now you can free up other opportunities that you may not have had available. So scheduling wise, not a, the elementary schedule is a very easy thing to create. This does remove some barriers to scheduling which gives you a few more opportunities uh, in your schedule for all the other grade levels as well. I just have a comment. And I, I think that uh, I'm going to go back to slide four. And, um, you know, I, again, another aggressive line of questioning, I guess, and I apologize for that. Uh, I, I do have a history on this board of being highly supportive of, of full day kindergarten, and I wish it would have happened sooner. Um, my comment would be can we strengthen our argument for the rationale for why we're doing this prior to taking action on February 27th? Um, mostly because this is a significant in investment of the community's resources from a district that has heretofore mostly been crying poor at certain points of, and, and, and the history I've been on the board. So if we're going to be investing you know, over a 10 year period, $9 million, um, can we make a case a, a stronger, I mean like there, there's some bits and pieces there, but can we really flush that out and make a really strong case for like how, what's, what's the community's ROI when it comes to this, this investment? What are, what are our kids going to get out of um, this, I mean, like, there's, like I said, there's bits and pieces there. Emily, you touched on some of it, which, which I thought was really important. But can we just make this a little bit more, um, uh, a, a nicer package for what, like, you know, parents, families, people who don't have kids here, um, can say, like, what, what they think the community's kids are going to get out of this additional time in the classroom. Yep, absolutely. You just really want that curriculum workshop to. But yes, we will absolutely. We, we I do happen to know that. somebody that did their dissertation on the benefits of full day kindergarten. So do I. I've been waiting so for this for so. a decade, so <laughs> I am, uh, I'm, I'm ready and willing to, uh, to help. But uh, I think one of the things that we're going to emphasize to that point is the alarming disappearance of play in a kindergarten program. And one of the things I think we are seeing throughout all grade levels, especially when COVID, when kids weren't able to play like they normally did, um, it's just the social ramifications that you see. And, and it's not like in the old days when we all went to a half day kindergarten program and were able to go out and play and socialize and learn a lot of those life lessons and learn proper behavior and how to interact with, with one another. Um, you don't get that. And so now to be able to be in that full day program where you can do academics, work on play, work on social stories, things like that, you're gonna see a huge uh, benefit, not only academically, but social and emotionally as well. And we certainly know that that is a, a huge area where uh, our kids are struggling across the board, but we can certainly do that as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? We really appreciate it, thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, this is now time for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but not, is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to a future agenda or addressed by administrative staff when appropriate. The board is allotted 30 minutes tonight. We ask that you keep your comment to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. No cards. Do I have any cards tonight? No cards. All right, well then that was for naught. Um, okay. <laughs> We will go on to our approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the January 9th, 2023 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion carried to approve the minutes of the January 9th, 2023 meeting as, um, uh, as uh, presented. Next up is our consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. 
Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. And in tonight's uh, consent agenda, there was uh, a new hire. So, Dr. Russell. Thank you. It's one of my favorite things to do as superintendent. <laughs> Tonight's personnel report included an appointment recommendation for the next principal of O'Neill Middle School. I'm very happy to recommend Ms. Lauren Humphreys to serve as O'Neill's next principal. She excelled throughout a very competitive interview process. The interview teams described her as enthusiastic, hardworking, student-centered, and dedicated. Additionally, her reference is noted that she's a strong leader who works closely with teachers and support staff to achieve great outcomes for students. She values staff input and will go above and beyond for all stakeholders. Finally, she's a proud alumna of O'Neill Middle School, Fairmount Elementary School, and Downers Grove South. We're beyond excited to welcome her back to her hometown. She currently serves as the assistant principal of Edison Middle School in Wheaton uh, District 200, a role she's held since 2016. Previously, she served uh, many years as a teacher, team leader, and department chair in School District 45 in Villa Park in Lombard. She also held leadership positions in the Villa Park Education Association and the IEA. She holds a master's degree in school leadership from Concordia University, a master's degree in teaching and leadership from St. Xavier University, and a bachelor's degree in elementary education from Augustana College. Welcome back, Lauren. We're happy to have you. And if you don't mind coming up and saying a few words. Well, thank you and good evening this evening. Um, I just have to say that I'm truly humbled and honored and thrilled to be chosen and selected as the next principal at O'Neill Middle School. As you know, I'm a product of District 58 and attended O'Neill. I have some very fond memories of my time there and I look forward to coming back home to give to the school and the community that gave so much to me. Um, I am eager to get to know the students and staff at O'Neill and I know that there are very big shoes to fill for Mr. Durala's long career at OMMS. But my goal is to build on what he has been accomplishing over the years and to continue to move forward working together to meet the vision and mission of District 58. I plan to provide a collaborative, supportive, and positive environment for the students and staff at O'Neill. I thank you very much for this incredible opportunity. Thank you thank so you. much. We got some recommendations for action tonight. The first up is the policy updates in press issue 110. Is there a motion to approve the policy updates in press issue 110 as recommended by the policy committee? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the policy updates and press issue 110 as recommended by the policy committee. Next up is the 2023-2024 school fees. Is there a motion to approve the fee schedule for the 2023-2024 school year as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried to approve the fee schedule for the 2023 through 2024 school year as presented. Next up is the copier lease agreement. Is there a motion to approve the copier lease uh, amendment as presented at a total cost of $628.81 per month for five years? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the copier lease amendment as presented at a total cost of $628.81 per month for five years. Uh, next up is the amendments to the architect's contract with White & Company. Is there a motion to approve the amendments to the architect contract with White & Company as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the amendments to the architect contract with White & Company as presented. 
Uh, last up is the resolution authorizing the transfer of monies for the working cash fund to the education fund. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing transfer of monies from the working cash fund to the education fund? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Just a quick question on this one doesn't list an amount. It seems like an ongoing potential back and forth. Is that right? Or to interpret it differently? It should be, it's a $9 million. It should be in the lease. It should, it should oh, it's in the, the other PDF. It's in the, it's in the resolution. It's in the resolution. Yeah. yeah. I see it now. Thank you. Just $10 million. Like, <laughs> yeah. $10 million. 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 $10 
to making sure that this would be a public process and informing the community along the way. But this is the first step in that long public process. That's helpful. Uh, just to make sure I'm clear, will will the public part of that be at District 58 meetings, at village meetings, or at independent meetings run by District 58? So a little bit of both, but more formally with the village of Downers Grove because they have to give the final approval over any traffic or any parking uh, because they're going to be the ones issuing the final permits and the RE will also weigh in on that as well. But the um, more formal side will have to go through the village because we can't move forward on any of those projects unless they approve. Uh, do you mind giving us a sense for not exact dates, obviously, because we won't have that yet, but a general sense on timeline? When should the public start to plan to hear the results of this traffic study or engagements in the public space, in the public arena around village council meetings? That's a great question. So I'm going to turn it over to Amy, who's in the audience from White & Company. Um, one of the advantages of working with Amy and White & Company is Amy was the lead architect on the District 99 project. So she's been through this process before with 99, and she's going to be assisting us as well. So Amy, you want to take it away? Thank you. Uh, so actually, we had preliminary conversations with the village and with the traffic consultant, KLA, and um, we, we tr were trending towards spring doing initial uh, studies so that we can get a good sense of not only vehicular but also pedestrian traffic um, before kids get out uh, of school. But what we're going to also do is um, we're going to look in conjunction with the preliminary planning uh, at both middle schools and, and so that our traffic consultant can take a look at what we're planning to do and make sure that that's going to work with the counts and they have some preliminary data in the neighborhood that they've they've already taken into consideration from from north so they're going to use some of that data that they they have already but also build on upon that about uh, new data and current uh, conditions as well as the projected enrollment increase at both of those middle schools um, Overall, we're planning on going into the village uh, for our initial submittal in fall of this year. Um, and with approval probably about six months later. So early 2024 would be the approval process with the village. Mm -hmm. And we will make sure throughout that process, through our regular channels of communication in the village, that we're putting that out there, um, in particular in those neighborhoods, uh, because again, that is exactly what we committed to. And so we want everybody to have a chance to weigh in and give their feedback through that process. What are those channels? Uh, so we send out through our community alert messages and then also the village will send out to people impacted in that particular area. So they have more direct contact with people, but we will also be reaching out like we always do as well. So it's a combination of the two. The more formal side is obviously done through the village because this has to be done in conjunction with them. Thank you. Uh, so I had a question too. Sure. You might want to stay there, Amy. <laughs> um, when we do these evaluations, can we try to ensure that maybe bad weather or cold weather days are somewhat included in those? Because even those students that are within the walking distance, non bus transport, they'll get driven to the school of both O'Neill and Herrick. Understood. Yeah. yeah. I live three blocks away, and I still. Don't <laughs> Yeah, one of the, the also the, one of the conversations we're having with White and Company, and, and it was clear in our, um, we made this a, a separate topic on our facility visioning nights, uh, both for our staff who are out there every day working in the parking lot, yeah. but then also for the um, community members that live close to these buildings, we wanted to make sure that we gave that a um, separate conversation just to kind of kickstart and get some feedback. Um, it is evident, and we're making this recommendation, that we have to decouple at Herrick the buses from um, right. the, the cars. And we already have that at O'Neill. One of the reasons O'Neill's a little bit more successful in their drop off and pick up is because of the decoupling of those two things. That's a, a kind of a, a non negotiable as we go through this process. Right now, we're unable to do that. Uh, because if you were to put the buses on Saratoga and they would stop, that arm would have to come out and it would stop all the traffic on there, making the problem worse. And so we are looking at every option that's on the table, uh, especially utilizing the east side of the building uh, on, off of Saratoga Avenue and um, making sure 
that all aspects of the property are looked at. One note that I do want to let the board know, it's not a floodplain or a flood zone, but we do have some drainage issues on the east side of the property. Downers Grove North ran into the same thing. Uh, they're not insurmountable, but certainly we're going to have to continue to have water conversations in terms of what we're going to do with the stormwater runoff if we uh, put any kind of surface, a hard surface on the east side of the building, which may likely happen. So we could be looking at what you saw at Downers Grove North. Um, I don't want to get too far in the weeds here, but permeable pavers, things like that, um, to help offset some of the water, which is one of the reasons you see a lot of brick streets on the north side of town to help with that too, because the, the sewer system just isn't there like it is in a newer subdivision. Okay. 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 Well, more information will be coming and we'll continue to keep the board and the public um, up to date. Thank you, Amy. All right, Mostly, please go roll. Let's see. <laughs> Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the middle school traffic study proposal. All right, that brings us to our announcements. We have uh, a legislative committee meeting on February 22nd at 3.45 p.m. at O'Neill Middle School. The district leadership team will meet on February 27th at 3.45 p.m. at uh, O'Neill Middle School. On February 27th at 7 p.m. will be our special meeting and curriculum workshop that will also be in O'Neill Middle School. And then on March 10th at 7 a.m. will be the next financial advisory committee meeting. And then March 13th at 7 p.m. will be our next regular board meeting, and that will be back here at Village Hall. All right, so tonight I have no items for the board for closed session. However, I do have meeting minutes from January the 9th, 2023. Is there any board members that would like to go into close to discuss those minutes? All right, since we do not have anyone, um, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the closed session meeting on January the 9th, 2023, as presented, and keep them closed so to the public <laughs> due to the confidential nature of their contents? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. I have a motion carried to approve the minutes from the closed session meeting on January 9th, 2023 as presented and keep them closed to the public due to the confidential nature of their contents. Let me finish this one. <laughs> Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the meeting is now adjourned at 9 p.m. Take it.